This episode is brought to you by EnviedHemp.com. Enved has been my choice for my CBD needs for almost a year now, and I can't begin to tell you how it has improved my life. They come in three formulas, clarity, relief, and relax. I take a clarity drop in the morning with my coffee to get me focused, then a drop of relief for my aches and pains and inflammation after a run or a workout. Then I do a drop of the relax before I go to bed to help me sleep. I've gotten some of the best sleep that I've had in years. Uh, And now with my whoop band, uh, my recovery band, I can prove it. And now they've come out with a new mixture called immunity, uh, which we all need to stave off uh, COVID-19. The immunity boost is a mixture of turmeric, grapefruit extract, elderberry, licorice root, and vitamin C, which we all could use a little bit more, I'm sure. I just got my first shipment in and took my first drop this morning. Uh, They come in drops, which is my choice, a tincture, roll-ons for those aches and pains, and then also gummies, which I think a lot of people out there use the gummies. So you can get it however you choose. So go place your order today. Go to EnviedHemp.com and use the code GURU20 for a 20% discount for life. CBD is a great supplement to keep you healthy and safe during these crazy times. So let's get to this week's episode. It's not what you know, it's what you can prove. You know how to cut to the core of me, Baxter. You're so wise. You're like a miniature Buddha covered in hair. I want to become a guru so girls will like me. Then I will like myself. Now before we do this, let's go over the ground rules. Rule number one. No touching of the hair or face. Of course. And that's it. Now let's do this. Are you not entertained? Are you not entertained? Is this not why you are here? What up, everybody? Welcome to another episode of the Golf Guru Show. I am Jason Sutton, and I am the guru. Where it is my mission to interview the top golf instruction minds in the business, break them down, get them to share all of their stories, best practices, and information that have made them great and successful, then ultimately share it with all of you so we can get better at teaching and coaching this crazy game. Make sure you download this episode and hit that purple subscribe button so you don't miss any future shows that will be coming your way. My guest on this episode is Steve Scott. Steve is the head professional for the Outpost Club and resides in Wake Forest, North Carolina. Steve is a great player and an outstanding golf professional that you probably remember as the guy who took Tiger Woods to 38 holes in the epic battle that was the 1996 U.S. Amateur Championship at Pumpkin Ridge, where Tiger won his third straight title, but not without a fight from my man Steve. Steve has had a very storied playing career, which includes the following highlights. He was Golf Week Magazine's number one ranked amateur in the, in the world, 1999. Uh, as I said, he battled Tiger Woods in the 1996 U.S. Amateur Final Match, and he had actually made it to the semis the previous year uh, at the age of 18, which is pretty phenomenal. Uh, he was a three-time NCAA All-American at the University of Florida, playing for uh, legendary coach Buddy Alexander. Uh, he has two professional victories on the Canadian Tour, 2001 Vancouver Open and the 2002 Texas Classic. Uh, He was the United States Walker Cup team member in 1997 and 1999. Uh, A U.S. World Amateur team member in 1996. Uh, Competed in the Masters Tournament in 1997. Uh, Qualified for the U.S. Open at Oakland Hills in 1996. And then competed on the PGA Tour and Nationwide Tour, uh, current Web.com Tour uh, as well. Uh, He was a Western Amateur Champion, both stroke and match play in 1999, and had a career low 12 under par 60 at Pine Tree Golf Club in Florida, a course record non-competitive round, and a career low competitive round of 10 under par 61 at Fort Myers Country Club in Florida, course record. And now is just uh, dominating uh, the club pro ranks where he was in the top 25 in the Met section, uh, points list in 2013, 14, and 15. And now in the Carolina section, uh, where he is as one of the best players in our section. 
Steve is just an all-around great guy that I was fortunate enough to meet at the PGA show where he attended one of my uh, teaching presentations and wanted to pick my brain on some of the teaching information as he, he prepared for some analyst TV work uh, that he does with PGA Tour Live. And he's been a commentator as well at Fox Sports, so he's diving into the uh, analyst and TV commentator space as well. So we spent some time together talking golf, uh, working on his golf game a little bit, and then talking golf swings, which was super cool. Uh, He's just a great guy, and I think you're going to enjoy this awesome conversation about his career, uh, his epic match with Tiger, and many other subjects about golf and life. So here he is, my good friend, Mr. Steve Scott. Enjoy. All right, Steve Scott, welcome to the show, man. Thank you so much for taking the time. I appreciate it. It's my pleasure, Jason. I wanted to start. Uh, with sort of how we met. And I thought it would be great for you to tell the story of, of how we met and sort of why we met. Well, I, I guess we met at uh, at the PGA show. PGA show was, uh, it's, <laughs> we meet a lot of people at the PGA show, but uh, you were doing a instructional seminar for Golf Business Network. And it was, uh, it, it, you just, I, I like the way you you come across and, you know, you're not, you don't come across like a know-it-all, but you're obviously, you're obviously very well informed. Um, and I just, just liked a lot of the, the, the things that you were saying and the, the concepts you were teaching and, um, and that was it. And, and, you know, I, I live in Winston-Salem now. I was a head pro up in the Met section in New York and the New Jersey section. And now I'm in the Carolinas PGA section. And so, well, we live about an hour apart. Uh, so I live a little north of you in Winston Salem. So uh, it it just kind of worked out for us to to meet up and uh, you know and get to know each other a bit. And I always like to keep learning and keep expanding my knowledge. And uh, I think the you know the big part of it I was uh, you know one of the one of the reasons really why was I was heading to uh, do some television broadcasting. I was doing some work for PGA Tour Live. They had a kind of like a swing channel in a way, and I was the swing instructor and at Pebble Beach uh, back in February before this all hit, and and I just wanted to kind of freshen my mind up a little bit, and and uh, you gave me some really good good thoughts, and away I went. Yeah, it was it was cool to have you to Carmel, and I got to have you back when all my technology is working. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> some camera issues, yeah. some track main issues, but um that'll that'll be fun. Um, but yeah, I'm, I'm really glad that we crossed paths and uh, looking forward to, to working with you more and, and getting you know getting to know you better and I've done a ton of research uh, for this podcast we've been threatening to do this for a few weeks now yeah. uh, so it's great to catch up but let, let's take let's take the listeners back for the two people out there that don't know who you are um, I'm not sure they know maybe the beginning right so like when you were a junior golfer how you got into the game and how you arrived at at high level, obviously, and playing at University of Florida. So take us through that. Right. I, I, I love the game ever since I was as, you know, whenever I could swing a club, I, my father or my pair, I got, I had this, this putting cup in my kitchen with this big plastic ball when I was three and whacked it down the kitchen. And, and then I, um, I, I got my first putter. I think my dad cut a putter down when I was five. I got my first set of clubs they were my grandmother's clubs. So when I was seven or something, I'm sure, you know, they, they were nothing like the U S kids clubs nowadays, but, uh, you know, just, just learn and love the game and love the, love the competition. I'll never forget the the first time I was playing in a, uh, I grew up in South Florida on the Southeast coast, right near Fort Lauderdale a city called Coral Springs. And there was the Broward County junior golf association, and I'm 10 years old. I'm playing in my first tournament ever in, in the D flight. And it's five holes in the red tees. And and for whatever reason, I guess it's just the competitive nature in me. I had an older brother and we always competed with things, whether, you know, maybe not so much in golf, but other sports. And and I remember saying saying to my parents, I was going to win this tournament. And I, you know, I never played a tournament in my life, but I had this, I don't know. I don't know where it came from. It's just kind of in my uh, in my psyche that, you know, I wanted to win. And I didn't win that day. Uh, but I think it was two tournaments later, I did win. I did win. I moved up to the sea flight and kind of moved on. And my love for the competition of the game and, and just trying to challenge myself and get better really grew from there and uh, moved on and had a nice high school career. We had a fantastic high school team 
Uh, we had a we had a team that was we won state high school championship in Florida two times. Uh, nice. Beat, beat a lot of a lot of really good players. I was lucky enough to uh, win the individual title my sophomore and senior year as well. So that uh, that landed me on the doorstep of University of Florida with uh, yeah. thankfully a full scholarship. Thank you, buddy Alexander, for that. And uh, just had, had had a tremendous time in Gainesville and played with some with some wonderful people and. And players like Robert Floyd and Josh McCumber and you know r- relatives of famous pros and they they knew how to yeah. play they were they were awesome and uh, we had we just had a great team and it was it was a ton of fun and but that's kind of you know in, in a in a quick little nutshell that's kind of you know through college really so for the message to some of the junior golfers that listen to the show and I know a lot of coaches do but. Talk a little bit about your recruiting experience. So did you have any more? I know you wanted to go to Florida because you're from Florida, right? You kind of always, was that your, right. sort of your dream school and, it was, and locked it, was, it down? Yeah, but, it, yeah, it was pretty much. Yeah. And so, so I don't know you work with, you knew, or have worked with you know, elite juniors and, and got them into college and like me or going through and taking the kids through that recruiting process and how it's changed over the years. I know when, when I was a kid, it wasn't as serious now and it's, you know, very, very different with social media and video and whatnot. So what was that like for you? And what advice would you give to young golfers coming up that want to play college golf? Well, right now it's a, it's a full on business. I mean, yeah. when I was, when I was looking at colleges, I don't remember one you know business or group out there that was really that you could go to. I mean, maybe there was, but I, I didn't, I didn't know. I was really ma- mainly a public course kid. Growing up, uh, my parents were we were a member of Inverary Country Club for two years of my life when I was 11 years old. So most of my life, I mean, I was a public course kid. I filled divots in high school to get play, playing privileges at our home course, and and you know, I, I I I didn't really have the luxury of of you know these these fancy country clubs that a lot of kids get to get to play. And I, I think that helped me a bit. I think that helped my my drive a bit. So, yeah. you know, I think one of the lessons that I learned is you, you don't, you don't have to have a, a, a fancy swing coach or a, um, although it helps a lot to have somebody who knows and I uh, looking back, it probably would have helped me a little bit more, but, but you, 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 you don't need as much as you, you think you need. I remember playing, uh, I mean, I, I played with, with, I, I bought a, a set of Hogan apex blades off of my high school teammate and probably didn't fit me at all. You know, I didn't have a set of clubs that, that really fit. I, you know, I had a, uh, I mean, when I played that, that, uh, well, I guess in, in high school, what kind of driver I play, I don't even remember. It was just some sort of hand me down maybe from my father, or it certainly wasn't anything fancy or, or, you know, I didn't go to a fancy place to get a, you know, souped up shaft. And, you know, we, we, we played with, I played with what I had and, and I learned how to I learned how to play and learn how to score and and um, I remember my father I mean we 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 were we were a middle middle class family and and we would go and I wouldn't get the the brand new balls from the sleeve we would there was a place that would that was like a scuba diving they would scuba dive for golf balls in South Florida there's ponds on every hole so we then we would go to a place and they would scuba dive for golf balls I think the guy sold you know, these, these, you know, two or out of his, out of his garage or something. And I was playing with these, with these Balata golf balls that were pulled from a pond and, you know, but I, I learned how to spin the ball. I learned how to hit shots. And, but the, the, really the, the inner drive of competition and wanting to get better was, it, it really drove me. So who, who taught you the game? Were you just that self-taught? There had to be some influence coming I, up to be as good as you were. Or well, still I, I had a, I had a coach. There was, when I was 10 years old, I met a guy, his name was Ray Daly. He was probably 75 years old at the time. And my father and I went to a, a like a, a golf show at some convention center in Fort Lauderdale and they had hitting nets like they do at some of these shows. And I was hitting balls into a net and I had a, this 10 finger grip that I, you know, just kind of, I grew up with. I didn't know any better and I was hitting it fine. And and this 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 older gentleman with a gray mustache and the Sansa belts and you just picture the guy you know the pocket and shirt and all that and he was you know with a gray beard and he 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 came up and he said let me see you hit one and I get up there and I hit it and and he he 
he was the one to first show me the overlap grip, the, the Varden grip. And, and I changed it. It really felt funny. It felt weird. And, yeah. and, and you know, I hit a few more and, and that was that at the end of, at the end of our, you know, five or 10 minute little, little session there, he said, Hey, why don't you come down to my golf course next week? And, and I'd love, I'd love to teach you. And I said, I said, that's, that would be great. And, and so my father and I, we got in the car the next Saturday morning and went down. It was Crystal Lake Country Club in Pompano Beach, Florida, and, and went down there. It was, uh, and, and, and we're hitting off mats. There wasn't like a lot of room, I guess. There wasn't a lot of grass or whatever. So we're hitting off mats. And, and Ray Daly, who he played the tour back in the 40s or the 50s, uh, he knew a lot, and, but he was just a giver. And, and he gives me this lesson, and we go through a few things. And at the end of the lesson, we go, well, how much do I owe you? And he, he says, nothing. You don't owe me anything. Wow. The, the yeah. man never charged me for a lesson, ever. Um, and I, 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 I thank him an awful lot. Uh, wherever he is up there in heaven, uh, he, he, he got me in love with the game, and he, he helped me and, and, you know, I mean, certainly helped me out. I, I, my parents wouldn't be able to afford a bunch of lessons for me and all that. And so he was, he was a savior of mine. That's amazing. So, so you go to Florida, right? You start, you have a nice little career. I guess your freshman year would have been what, 95? Nine, yeah, the fall, fall of 95. Yeah. Yeah. So you're, you're playing pretty good and you, you qualify for the USAM that year yep. and make it to the semis. Yeah. Right. So you're no joke, right? You're moving up the, you're moving up the board. So tell us a little bit about from there leading up to the 96 USAM, obviously the elephant in the room that you've never been asked about, I'm sure. Never. No, right? we'll, but we'll, 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 we'll chat about it some more though. I got, we've got a lot to tell on that one, but absolutely. Uh, yeah. I mean, yeah. You know, the, it never gets old, but yeah, give us, give us a little lead up and then we can get into to some of that, that week, which is amazing. So the, the coming up in, in, you know, kind of when finishing up high school and I get this scholarship and I'm on my way to university of Florida, I had a nice, I played it. I did play in some AJGA events. Um, um, and I, you know, I played in a few local ones in South Florida. I won a couple, which was great. Um, it kind of got me on the map a little bit and played well in the U S junior amateur. Uh, one year I finished second in the stroke play. I lost in the second round of match play. That was my first ever experience in match play. So, but I'm glad I had oh, really that good. because that was in 1994 at Echo Lake in New Jersey. And I'm glad I had that experience because I wouldn't have, I, I wouldn't have felt as good going into match play for that 95 USAM. And, and, you know, the, the story of getting to that 95 AM, I mean, my, I met my, well, my wife now I've, I've got to add her in my wife, Christy, we've been married over 20 yes. years now. And, and we went to, we met our senior year of high school. And she was a golfer herself. She's an LPGA teaching instructor now. And, and, um, but she's always, she's always been in the game. And so I had, uh, I had her caddy for me in the 95 U S amateur qualifying down in South Florida. And it rained, like we played, we played, I can't remember if it was 36 holes on the same day or if it was split up 18 and 18, but I remember it being a long day and it rained a lot and she kept the bag perfectly dry. The clubs, everything was great. And I won the qualifier. I think I shot about six under for two days and, and I won and it was on my way to, to Newport country club. And I said, you know, I said, you can have the bag whenever you want, honey, you got it. So, yeah. so she's, she's caddy for me a lot since then. And we'll, we'll go through that a little bit more, but, sure. um, but yeah, Christy, uh, you know, really helped. And, and anyway, so went up to Newport country club and I played, you know, I'm this, this cocky, I mean, I just turned, I just turned 18. I, I turned 18 July of that. So a month before um, I just turned 18 and I'm playing in the USAM, the biggest event I've ever played in my life. And I had that confidence. I played pretty well that year and, and won a couple of junior events or something. And, and I, and I get out there and I first round of stroke play was at the alternate golf course, a golf course in Rhode Island called Wanam Autonomy country club and kind of a very short course, very slopey, fast greens. And, had a great day. I shot 67 and I'm tied for the lead after the first round of stroke play in the U S amateur. I'm 18 and I'm, I'm crap in my pants. And so, but, but I'm very, but I'm still confident. Yeah. And so, and so I get out there the next day and start in the back nine at Newport. And I think I shoot it's par 70, 35, 35. And I shoot, I shoot one over. I make the turn. I'm coming to the first, 
the first tee. And it's in the afternoon at this point. And Newport Country Club, if anybody knows out there, is there's no irrigation. So it's like it's as dry and as crispy as, you know, you'd have it uh, over in Scotland or something on a on a on a dry summer day. I mean, it was it was as firm and as fast. And that's how Buddy Marucci ended up playing so well, too, because he was not a long hitter and he was right. able to compete with with Tiger Woods because you got 60 yards of roll at this place. And so long story short, I get to that 20 you know, eighth hole of the stroke play. And I'm passing by a friend of mine I see on the putting green. I, he's like, hey, how you doing? I said, as long as I just keep on my two feet, I'll be fine. I'm, I'll, I'll, be, I'll be in this thing. And I proceed to just bogey my way around the back nine. I'm choking. Karma. I'm choking. <laughs> and, and everything, you know, like the greens are dry and crispy. And it's one of them, like, my putting stroke is failing me. I'm like, oh, my gosh. Like, I'm going to miss it. I'm, I'm leading the thing after day one. I'm going to miss this thing. Get to the 36th hole, drive it in the fairway bunker, have to pitch out, uh, hit it up by the green, miss the green. And I knew it's going to be really close at this point. I'm like, I'm like six over par for the day. And so three over for the event. And get up there, miss the green, chip up to like eight feet. And I'm so nervous on this putt. Like, I know it's going to be, it's going to come down. It's to one shot, make or miss. And I get up there. I somehow squeak this ball in from eight feet. And I get to the board and I make it in by a shot. I missed like a 20 for two playoff by a shot. Oh, geez. And, and so it was like, whoo, I was, I'm I'm in. I mean, once you get into match play, it's like anything's fair game. It's like a whole brand new tournament. So, uh, it just had a lot of confidence, uh, and an interesting stat that year in '95, I'll throw at your listeners. The it, it, I played, I made it all the way to the semifinals, yeah. and had had a really nice run. I lost to Buddy Marucci on the 19th hole, and and he made a birdie, and I made a par, and and but in that whole entire run in '95, and this may never it may never be duplicated again. I never played somebody that was in college. I would played only mid ams the whole way through. Okay. Pretty, pretty crazy, huh? Yeah. Think about that. You wouldn't uh, nowadays. USAM is all a bunch of college kids hitting it yeah. three hundred in the air. Yeah. So uh, that's that was a. Uh, it, it just shows you a sign of the times of of you know kind of at that point things start to change and there's less and less mid ams that play and and are yeah. out there. So. Yeah, that had to give you, I'd say, a lot of confidence going in to the next summer, right? Because I know then you win or you play well on a couple of big events, right? Did you win a couple of big amateur events leading up to the 96? Yeah. Well, amateur. I was, I was really close. So everybody yeah. knows that I was the runner up to Tiger Woods in that US amateur pumpkin Ridge. Well, yeah, yeah. I was pretty much runner up in every event that year. Um, I was runner up. Uh, I was runner up in the Northeast amateur. I totally blew that one. Jason Enlow, who was uh, the coach at SMU, he, he ended up beating me. Uh, I bogeyed my last four holes to lose by a shot. That was that was punishing. Uh, I was runner up in the Sunny Hand Amateur as well, but I, it was more of a backdoor runner up, if you will. I lost by a shot, but I shot sixty seven or six the last day, and I was, I, you know, I wasn't wasn't really in contention going to the final round, but I, I played pretty well. And then I was runner up in the USAM. I was runner up in the Dixie Amateur. Um, so I was, I was runner up in, in a lot of things that year, but that 1996, the summer uh, that I played tiger, uh, I had that lot of confidence coming off that, that first year at university of Florida. Sure. And we played the NCAA at, uh, the honors course in Chattanooga, unbelievably difficult Pete Dye of course. This is the one where uh, many, many people may know that tiger woods shot 80 in the final round and still won. Yeah, and I, I it, the greens were as firm and as fast as they could be. I shoot two under par in the last round. I tie for ninth or something. I as a freshman, that's back when it was just stroke play. And so I get like so we fly home and and uh, two days later I've got qualifying for the U.S. Open at Bay Hill. We're playing thirty six holes at Bay Hill one day, and you get out to Bay Hill and I was playing a practice round and I'm like, well, it's no rough out here. It's like there was no rough. The greens were slow. I mean, it, 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 like the, the honors course was just such a hard test that anything from that seemed really easy. And, and Bay Hill looked really easy. So I'm like, I'm, I'm going to make this thing. And I get out there and I shoot. I, I'm, I'm, I'm right on the number going to the very last hole and it's into the wind. 
and I kind of miss hit my drive, my burner bubble driver at the time. You could miss hit drivers back then. You can't do it now. And I miss hit this drive a little bit. I've got like 210 into the wind and I pull out my two iron. And the pin wasn't in the traditional back right Sunday placement. It was more kind of in the middle part of the horseshoe there. But if you blocked it a little right, you were going to go in the, in the water. Mm-hmm. And so I get up there and I get hit this two iron and I hit it pretty good, but I hit it right of the flag. I'm like, oh no, like I'm, this ball's into water, carries the water by like a foot <laughs> and, and rolls up there about 30 feet behind right of the hole. And so my, 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 uh, my roommate, my freshman roommate at the time, a guy named Brandon Schneider, he was caddying for me. My, and Christy, my, my girlfriend at the time, wife now was out there watching and they, they had talked to a rules official and they, they knew where I stood and I didn't know. I kind of, I knew it was going to be close, but I kind of yeah. didn't want to know. I wanted to just stay in the process. And so I get over this 30 footer and I'm looking at the putt and I look at Brandon and I say, you know, I'm just going to try to get this ball close. If it goes in, it goes in. If not, I don't want any stress. And I get up there. This putt's got about two feet of right to left break and grain pushing or pulling hard from the right. And, and I get up there and I hit an unbelievable putt and I curls in the right corner and I make it from 30 feet oh gosh. and I make the U S open on the number. I get the last spot. I beat Dickie pride out by like a shot, no playoff getting clean. <laughs> and, and I'm an 18 year old playing in, in, in the U S open. <laughs> That's incredible. Yeah. So how did that go? How did, how'd you play? <laughs> it it, it kind of kept going. I, I shoot, I birdied my very first hole. At Oakland Hills, it was Oakland Hills that year where Steve Jones ended up winning. And I shoot, I shot, I birdied my first hole. I was tied for the lead um, after eleven holes that day. I was one under par on the leaderboard. Like, I mean, it's like I'm out of my mind. Like, how, like, how does that feel? I'm out of, it's, oh, <laughs> right? I mean, it's. I mean, I hold a thirty footer on the first hole for birdie. The game right the game, out of the gate. The game seems easy, right? It's like right those out of time. the gate and you just, you know, you I just I got out of my own way and you know when you're a, when you're a junior golfer you you tend to do that. You tend to just kind of go play the game for what it is instead of there's not a lot of baggage and mm-hmm. and so yeah, I, I I had a great run shot 71, 73 and made the cut. I was tied for 45th going to the weekend at at the US Open at 18 years old. Jeez. And and unbelievable. I, I had a poor weekend. I shot eighty one seventy six on the weekend. I was paired with Ian Woosnam in the third round and and played awful and and but the experience was it was unbelievable. Yeah. It was absolutely it the group. Doesn't matter. It was you know, I, <laughs> like I, I got to make I got that is amazing and as it is. I got to I got to play, you know, my father was out there and it ends on Father's Day every year and I got to play at the U.S. Open, and, you know, my father out there watching. I mean, it was, I mean, it doesn't get any better. That's crazy. All right, so take us to the to the Tiger match. You're, you <laughs> you get through. I don't think anybody knows like who you who you played to get to that final match, right? So like, what, what were you feeling like? Yeah, I, I've heard, I've seen the in the commentary, I've seen the documentary, and I was, I mean, I remember, I remember watching the match. I mean, I, you. Every, anybody over 40 years old probably still remembers how epic that that day was of just amazing golf so kind of take us from the beginning and, and then walk us through the beginning of it that. was so so kind of like the year before the drama just to get to match play i went the opposite way at pumpkin ridge so i shoot 79 the first day of stroke play at pumpkin ridge 79 somebody who shoots 79 in the first day of stroke play 99.9 times out of a hundred, you're not going to make match play. You just, it's not going to happen. And I got up the next day and it was the strangest thing. And, and this is, this is kind of a lesson that I've taken with me and I can, you know, pass on to your listeners. I got out there the next day and I had, I had this swing thought. I just, I don't know. I just kind of went through my mental Rolodex of swing thoughts before I hit the range and I had an afternoon tea time and, and I got out there and I, I hit a few shots and it felt really good. And I, and I, then I, with a short iron, and then I took like a five iron and I hit maybe five more shots and it felt really good. And then I hit like a few drivers and I'm like, this is it. I, I, I mean, I probably hit 15 or 20 balls total before that second round. And when I shot 66 and I just had this thought and I, the ball was going where I was looking, I said, I'm not messing this up. I'm just, I'm going with it. I'm going with this thought. And that was yeah. it. And I was in this zone 
the whole day. I don't even think I talked. Christy was caddying for me. I don't think I talked to her once. I really don't. <laughs> uh, I was in this, man, I was in this like trance like state and, and just, just, I shot the round, you know, five under par, no, no, no bogeys and made it again, made the match play by one shot. Wow. And missed a playoff, missed like a 20 for three playoff or something, something you don't get through, you know? And, and, um, so yeah. But you, and, but you got crazy momentum after that, right? You're kind of like, okay, <laughs> now, now, now it's game on, right? Anything can happen. Again, same, yeah, same sort of thing. Like the mindset, I, this is why I love match play. And we can talk match play strategy if you want Absolutely. to, but, yeah. but sure. I mean, match play has always been a, always been a good friend of mine. I had a, uh, a great run in 1999, winning the Western amateur, uh, which is a match play a stroke play in a match play, but, uh, I always love match play. Match play is like, it's the purest form of golf. Cause you're not worrying about anybody else, but, and so I kind of, the, the putter was really feeling good and, I, you know, it seemed like every match I would hit some, make some kind of semi miracle putt or chip some ball in that, you know, I would never chip in or just something and you know, all these things happened. And, and, uh, and I actually got a little revenge on Buddy Marucci from the year before we played each other in that semifinal match in 95 where he beat me. So we faced each other the next year in the quarterfinals, which is mm-hmm. pretty rare that we would go that far again. And, uh, you know, kind of be paired in the same bracket like that. And I birdie the last, I, I win the last two hole. I birdied 17 and part 18 to win. I was one down going to 17. I win the last two to win wow. one up. And so that was pretty, that was pretty huge. And, and then I played my, my college teammate, Robert Floyd in the semifinals and which was tough. You know, it was, I was going to say that had to be difficult, right? It it was yeah it really it kind of was because you know one of us is going to play in the Masters and one isn't I mean yeah. the finalists get to the Masters and and Tiger actually played his his teammate Joel Kreibel, uh in the semis That's as well right. so it was yeah. Stanford versus Florida in a way and and um, yeah it was it was a little awkward I I mean we we had a great match I ended up winning the last three holes to win three and two and I'm going to the masters <laughs> and I'm, I'm playing Tiger Woods the next day in the finals yeah. for, you know, for all the marbles for history. And it's just, you know, you, you, you put, you put my mind back in that, in that mindset and you still, I still get goosebumps. Like the mind just kind of, it, 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 uh, it knows, it remembers how I felt and sure. it's, it's, it was the coolest, absolutely coolest feeling ever. So before we get to the match and then some of the, the details, cause there's many, and I want to hear some stories. Like, give give us that match play strategy. What are, what are the keys? If somebody or young, you know, back to the young junior golfer or college golfer that is picking your brain about that, I mean, what would you share with them? Match play is it's its own entity, right? Every every hole is its own tournament, and so it's it's very easy to to play and forget, and and whereas stroke play, everything piles up. Match play, it's like you finish the hole, it's done. Like you, it's it's so much easier to play in the present in match play because every hole is its own tournament. So so you get so that 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 mindset I think really really helped me as as compared to stroke play. Um, I was always and putting has always been a strong suit of mine. So great putters usually win match play. Um, you know, your Kevin Kisner's, your Matt Kuchers of the world who've done very well in the, the PGA Tour match play events. Mm-hmm. Uh, the You know, Ian Poulter's of the world thrive in match play because they know that that one, you know, they, they have a 20 footer for birdie or for par that they make and their opponent misses a, an eight footer for birdie and they tie the hole. And and, you know, they they've. they've it, it's very demoralizing for your opponent when you when they see you bury and putts from everywhere. So so I really you know, making putts is, was a, was a huge thing for me and a huge asset in match play. And, and then I had kind of the, you know, the, the Corey Pavin, Kevin Kistner bulldog mentality in a way you you have to, you have to have that really. Um, You, you kind of have to have that, that want to, you know, just step on somebody's throat out there really. Um, And that's kind (laughs) of, that's kind of what I, I, I enjoy trying to do and, be, you know, challenged to do every time I get out there. And, uh, you know, another thing in match play I always felt was critical was the, the 12th, really the 12th through 14th holes or 13 through 15, right in there. There's always a little, uh, 
that gap in there, those are the most important holes in match play. You know, you hmm. could be you could be three down through the front nine, but if you play 12 through 14 well, and let's say you win three in a row, now you've just totally shifted the momentum now and you got the match back to square. Um, and, and then you can kind of ride that momentum a little bit into the last few holes and hopefully, you know, close your opponent out. Or, you know, if you're, if you're up by a couple, uh, going into those holes, you, you can make sure on those holes that you play a little bit, you can play a little bit more conservatively and let, make your opponent hit the shots. You know, if you, you keep making pars or playing smart golf and you force your opponent to, to hit a great shot, you know, one, you know, one time, you know, 50% of the time they're going to miss a green and make a a dumb bogey and you're going to win an easy hole. So, so you just have to kind of, you know, people always ask, you know, do you play the golf course or do you play, do you play the opponent? Well, the answer is both. (laughs) You have have to have a sense of kind of when to, when to strike and when to play smart and cautious based on, the status of the match and the whole location and how it fits your ball flight and, and, and just, and how you're feeling at that point, you're always having, you know, whether it's match player, stroke player, and I could talk about this till the cows come home, but yeah. you're always having to make, you're always having to assess your, your skill at each point during the round. Right. Like, and because that, that totally dictates how aggressively or how conservatively you play. I know a lot of, a lot of your listeners out there probably, abide by the decade method or, you know, mm-hmm. Scott Foss has created a, a great system for people to understand strategy. But when you, you know, for me, it was kind of, we didn't have decade, we didn't have all that stuff, but it was kind of just right. in, I just had it within me. I understood, I understood the strategy of the game for whatever reason at a young age. And, and, and I knew, I knew when to, when to strike and when to play smart. And, you know, the point where you have to step up and make a putt, you just, you will it in. And Tiger Woods was, uh, he was one who did that better than anybody and still does to this day. Yeah, no doubt. And that's, that's very well said. I think that's, that's such a great way to explain sort of what I would call self-awareness of your, of your own game and your momentum. Uh, one of the books that I always recommend kind of older book from TJ Tomasi called the 30 second golf swing. And he talked about having that, awareness of like, do you have your A, B or C swing? And then that should dictate how aggressive or how conservative you play. Right. right? Cause most of my juniors or my, my college players are, you know, they get behind early in the count, right. They make a couple bogeys and they get more aggressive. I'm like, that's the time when you need to be more conservative. Right. So until you get control of your golf ball or find a, a swing thought or find a feel yeah. um, it's, it's almost the opposite. So you obviously had that innate ability to do that. Um, you, which is incredible. Yeah, you, you pick and choose whole locations that fit your ball right. flight, and you you can't play you 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 can't play a conservative shot when the shot fits you perfectly, and then vice versa. You shouldn't play an aggressive shot when the shot doesn't fit you. It's it's pretty. Exactly. You know, I remember. I don't know. I don't know who said this, but you know, it's like know what you know what you can do, know what you can't do, and don't try to do what you can't do. <laughs> it's a really simple, simple formula to follow. Exactly. All right. So you, you, you're getting ready to play Tiger Woods and he's obviously, you know, he's going for three in a row, which is enormous pressure on him. I probably history wise. And so what was your mindset? Did you, did you sleep very well the night before? Did you have any certain strategy or are you just like, okay, I'm just going to go in and just yeah, see what that- happens? There was there was a real good strategy. I, I was fortunate enough that earlier that year in a collegiate event, about eight months prior in the fall of '95, I was paired with Tiger. He at, didn't remember it, by the way. I, <laughs> right? I don't care. <laughs> I know. But, I know. I yeah. was just. I thought that was funny. He's like, he doesn't remember, but we actually did play together. <laughs> <laughs> but uh, yeah, no. But um, uh, yeah, so we. Yeah, I mean that shows you how in the moment he is. But yeah, he he shot. We were paired in the final round at Hilton Head or something, and I think I shot eighty that day, and he shot seventy, and he was he was medalist or co-medalist or something. And and he, I just remember him watching him hit these towering three irons, two hundred and thirty-five yards, you know, onto a par five, and I'm like, I can't do that. I mean, I just I can't hit that shot. 
And I was watching him a lot that day. So, which totally helped me. I mean, it's totally got me ready for that final match because Christy and I were trying to develop a strategy. And the, the, one of the big strategies was I'm not going to watch him hit a shot. Like I'm not going to, I'm not going to watch, I might watch a ball flight for if there's any wind or whatever, or, right. but I'm, but I'm not going to, I'm not going to get, I'm not going to get caught up in what he's doing. Cause I can't, cause he, he out drives me by at least 50 yards. Um, if not more. And, you know, there was just physically not a match there, but, but I knew I had an edge on him in the putting mm -hmm. and in putting, I, 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 I cleaned his clock pretty well. He hit the ball so well that day though. Um, after the, you know, after the first five holes or something, I mean, he, he hit the last, he hit 28 of the last 29 greens in regulation. So, so wow. he really didn't miss a green most of, you know, you know, over 75% of the day. So, um, that was, that was really, you know, his calling card and, and I just hold a bunch of putts. I actually played the par fives better than he did that day, uh, which was crazy enough, but, um, but yeah, it, it was, it was a monumental day. Obviously he was going for golfing history, immortality. Nobody had won three us amateurs in a row yeah. and little old me was trying to beat him, but my mindset really, it didn't change from, uh, and I think you probably whoever watched that match on TV or saw my saw my eyes knew that I oh, wasn't. Yeah. I mean, I wasn't intimidated. I wasn't going to be intimidated. I remember walking down the first hole at seven fifteen that morning, and I turned to Christie's Tiger's fifteen yards ahead of me or something, and I and I noticed for the first time that Jay Brunza, his sports psychologist for so long, uh, and and had caddied for him in all previous five USJ finals that he had won, was not on the bag. And I was, I kind of scratched my head for a second. I'm like, he doesn't have a sports psychologist with him. I'm going to crush this guy. <laughs> I remember, I remember saying that, and yeah, and I true. firmly, I firmly believed it. And and I went out in the morning. I shot, if it was stroke play, I shot like 68, and he shot 76 or seven. I was, but he yeah. made a triple somewhere. I was five up, and and you know, if if you're five up. And somebody comes up to you and says, I'm going to tell you that you're going to shoot two under par in the afternoon and you're not going to win. I would talk on a USGA setup, talk, you know, thick, rough, fast greens. I'm going to, I'm going to tell you total BS. And, yeah. and you know, the guy who did it was maybe the only guy who could have done it. <laughs> yeah. Greatest player ever. Yeah. Um, that's amazing. Yes. Yeah, so you, you go out five up. I mean, you're how much were you wishing? Like I could just like, let's just keep going. Right. Cause you get that hour and a half break. Yes. It had to probably just kill your momentum. So tell the listeners what you did at the break. Yeah, that, that, <laughs> that hour and a half break, it, it was tiger certainly needed it. Butch Harmon was out there and you know, he let's face it. Coach. Yeah. He was, he had, he had, you know, he had a whole team out there. Nike was <laughs> Phil Knight was out there ready to hand him $40 million contract. And, uh, you know, I guess I was probably the only amateur out there that day. Let's face it. But anyway, that's another story for another day. Uh, yeah. Uh, but yeah, so so you know, it was a hot day, and I wasn't going to tire myself out in the range worrying, you know, working on anything while you know Tiger's out there trying to fix something. And and you know, my wife, as any good doting uh, better half that you would have, would say, you know, hey, hey, let's go shopping. Let's let's try to let's make sure that we have something to bring home and remember this week by and. And so lo and behold, we go to the merchandise tent and, and pick up a shirt and a hat and a few other things. And, and, uh, yeah, we, we spent part of the, part of the hour and a half intermission shopping. That's great. <laughs> hey, at least you didn't wear the hat. Like that, that, that bugged me that he's got the US Am hat on. Like that's such a, <laughs> that's such a faux pas nowadays, right? No kid, well, any good would probably ever do that. <laughs> right. Uh, Tiger's head, Tiger's headwear was, uh, was suspect there for a little while back from the trip Keeney yeah. uh, days with the Tom kite straw hat. And, uh, anyway, no but Ni yeah. Ni Nike got him suited up <laughs> just, just fine after we played. <laughs> exactly. So you, so you go to the back, the back 18, right. And he starts to make his little charge, like not, not because you're playing poorly. You just started lighting it up. Yeah. Yeah. He, he hold a 10 or 12 footer for par on the first hole coming out. Uh, just to not go six down and wow. it kind of sparked a little life in him. And uh, a couple holes later he flagged it and it was to gimme and I may, I, I didn't make birdie and then he flagged it again and I didn't make birdie on a par five where I should have. And, 
And, and then the next hole, I missed like a five footer for par, a little D cell stroke and missed it low of the break. And, and all of a sudden I'm only two up. I mean, it was like instant and I'm like, yeah. okay, this game is on. And, yeah. and then the TV coverage starts on the next hole and, and 15,000 people, it's, you know, now you got a huge gallery <laughs> and it's, it's, it was just, you know, the, the, the energy out there was, was just something, you know, we, we traded blow for blow and, I, I had uh, I had an opportunity to go three up with maybe ten holes to play, and I missed a a, ma- a very makeable a short, really pretty short uh, putt on the twenty sixth hole or something, and uh-huh. and he he makes birdie on the twenty seventh hole, and like we we had this epic back and forth where he makes birdie to go only one down with nine to play. And then I hit this flop shot in on the 28th yeah. hole. And then he amazing. holds a monster 40 footer for Eagle with four or five feet of break up and over a hill and like a putt, you could three putt half the time. And, and you know, it's just uh tiger woods did tiger Woods stuff and you just have to kind of sit back and, and, it, you know, kind of admire it in the moment, not don't get mad because that's right. what you kind of, what you have to, you know, another lesson for match play is you, you have to expect your opponent to hit a great shot. I mean, I think that that's something that, you know, they have to expect them to, to make some putt. So it, you know, it doesn't shock your system. And, yeah. and I think I did a pretty good job of that. You did. And, and, you know, then you show probably one of the greatest pieces of sportsmanship on 16 when you, he forgets to move his marker back. You could, you could have won the match, right? If you don't remind him to move his mark back, and I thought that was just such a class act. And what's golf? What I was actually sharing that. I was t- telling one of my students this morning that I was having you on the show and I was dropping the, the some trivia. Then he's like, yeah, yeah, I remember that guy, you know? And I said, but do you remember what happened on 16? And he goes, that's, that's what, get, that's what golf's all about. The integrity of the game. So yeah. share a little bit about that story. Cause I think it's just, it was just great. That um, moment, that moment. Yeah. It was, I'm two up with three to play. If I win this hole, I, I win the U S amateur and, and, and I get out there and, and, and he out drives me. We both take driver on this very straight away, 430, 40 yard hole or something. And he drives it way down there, about 50 or 60 past me. And, and I've got six iron and he's got wedge and the pins back, right. And my ball, I only hit draws. I only hit right to left shot. So I got to like aim in this bunker to hook it back in and, you know, really foolish at the time, but it's kind of the only shot I hit. And, and um, so I block it in the bunker, which is the same thing I did in the morning 18 and don't have as good enough of a lie this time to spin it or anything and and hit it about 10 feet past the hole. And he hits his wedge up there about six feet from the hole and he's got a birdie putt. And I got a par putt. I'm, I have to make it to force him to to make his putt to win the hole outright. And his marks in my line. And like you would do any Saturday morning, I said, hey, you know, just we just slide that over one. So he went up there and moved it over. and. I got up there and I knew I have to make this putt and I'm, I'm as nervous as, as anybody. And, and I get up there and I hit a pure putt dead center. I mean, great putt in the circumstance. I mean, I, the, the match is on the line. I hit this great putt. I just, I summon something from the inside and, and, and I'm walking off the green and just out of the corner of my eye, I see like not enough time transpired uh, for, from when, I was walking like his his like his mark was his ball was already down. I'm like, wait a second. So he didn't yeah. he didn't he didn't move his mark back. So I kind of looked over my shoulder and as I'm walking off the green, I said, you know, hey, did you move that back? And you know, without saying a word, he he had to pick his ball up and and move his mark over to where where his ball originally lay. And and you know, if I walked off the green in another fashion, I might not have seen him. And, and Christy yeah. was down there raking the bunker. So she, before, when I asked him to move it, so she didn't even see me tell him to move it. And, you know, who knows if somebody from the gallery or would have, somebody would have said something, you know, yeah, the referee, it, right? the USGA referee's not, he's not out there to interfere with that part of the match, uh, just to give rulings. And, and it would have been really strange to win it that way. Cause if he, sure. he plays it from the wrong spot, he loses the hole and I win three and two. And, wow. And, you know, it's, it's, it is kind of what golf is all about. You're right. It's, it's, it's about that sportsmanship integrity. Every other sport you play, you are, 
you have a referee out there blowing a whistle or throwing a flag and you're, you're trying to get away with as much as you can in golf in, you know, you're kind of, it's a self-policing game. Right. right. And so, so there was no referee out there to, to say anything. And, and it, it would have been really strange because I, I could have easily forgotten. I mean, sure. you know, I was, it was elated from coming off the green and I was ha- really happy I made this putt. And I could have just been in my own little world walking to the 17th tee, which wasn't too far away. And, and I could have totally missed it. I could have totally missed it. And, you know, if I did, I would have got, I, you know, people would have blamed me for doing it on purpose or whatever. And, and, but to this point, to this day, I mean, I mean, I like not doing it never crossed my mind. I mean, which, which does, you know, some people, some people on purpose ask somebody to move it and on purpose don't tell them to move it back. I've, I've exactly. heard stories like that and you probably had in junior golf all the time. <laughs> probably have it too. And that's, you know, it's, yeah. it's, you know, it, it's, it's just not, it's not golf in my mind. And, and it's the right thing to do. And that's, and, and that you should be applauded, you know, for and, that. But again, it's not, a, it's not a decision that you have to make. You just do it. It's, it was a reflex action completely. Right. And, and I hope it's a reflex action for every golfer out there because, should it should be. It should be. I ask him to move it over. So, hey, I remind him to move it back. Yeah. I, I always, uh, always ask one of the, the later questions in, in my show of, you know, did you have a failure or a favorite failure that sets you up for later success? But I'm guessing that I wouldn't even consider this a failure, like losing, you know, again, you lost to the, the greatest player ever. And it, I, right. I would say that it, probably spurred you on to, to greater things. Would you not say that? Well, in a lot of ways it did. I mean, in a lot of ways, you know, it, it, it wasn't any fun not winning. Right. I mean, you play to win, you play, I played, I played as great as I could play in the circumstance. I mean, you know, national television, NBC cameras, and I mean, it was all those people watching in, in person and the magnitude of the moment. And, and, I couldn't have been more pleased the way I played. And you you'll, you can see it in my face when you see the interview that Roger Malpe did with Tiger and I. And, you know, I mean, it was like it was partial relief because the tournament is so long. I mean, it's a week-long tournament, not including practice rounds. So, you know, you're in this grind mode for forever, it seems like. And, you know, when it's all done, it's like, oh, I can breathe. And and in a way, that's what it was. You know, I left I left everything I had on that golf course that day. I didn't have one more ounce of, of focus or, or great shot in me. I, I didn't. And I forced. You guys, you guys went extra holes too. Like you had, we, you went, had 38, we went 38 holes. We went two Crazy. extra holes, one of the longest matches ever in U.S. Amateur history. So against, you know, the, the greatest player ever. I mean, three U.S. Amateurs in a row will never be topped in our lifetime. And maybe, no. maybe in several lifetimes, because people won't stay amateur that long to, to accomplish True. that goal. So, uh, it's, it's what he did and that moment. And, you know, it, it's kind of crazy to think that I was the other guy there that day, but you know, the, I, I was there, you know, the tiger had a lot of things in his life kind of, I kind of just work out really perfectly. You know, there's, he's had a lot of, a lot of great breaks and a lot of lucky breaks. And he's had a lot of tremendous golf shots. I mean, the yes. ball that he hit in the first U.S. Amateur that he won should have gone in the water on the 35th hole with with Trip Keeney, and it mm-hmm. doesn't. Um, there's so many things that happened that were very serendipitous for Tiger, and you know, it's it's almost like we're all these. It's, he he was he's supposed to do what he did for golf, and and I played this. I played a role. I played it, you know, just like Bob May and Rocco Mediate, and I played the role in the amateur world for that. And, you know, and I, and I, I played it to the best of my ability and, you know, it's just sometimes things in life just aren't meant to be. Do you ever think back and say, you know, think about what would have been if you would have won, like how your life would have been different? Or do you think everything would have been pretty much? Cause you turn pro, like you have a, you have a pretty solid pro career afterwards. And obviously you're in the masters anyways. Uh, yeah. Do you ever just sort of dream about that? Yeah. I, yeah. Sure. Have- I do. Uh, you yeah. know, I think that, that, you know, I think that the thing about golf that's different than other sports, it, it wouldn't be, it's not like I'm guaranteed if I win that match and win the U S amateur, it's not like I'm guaranteed stardom, you know, people, and I was only going to my sophomore year of college. So 
people weren't leaving college early back then. I mean, that wasn't even right. a thought. Tiger Woods started a lot of trends in golf and leaving college early was one of them. Um, mm -hmm. Totally. And now a lot of people do it. And yeah. so, so, but nobody did it back then. Not Justin Leonard, Phil Mickelson, you know, all those David, I don't know if David Duvall did like, like those guys, they played their whole college careers and, and Tiger played too. So anyway, it, it's, uh, you know, to be linked with, you know, the greatest player or the second greatest major winner of all time, or however you want to look at it. It's, uh, it's pretty cool. That's cool, man. Thank, thank you for sharing that. Sure. Um, is there, is there any question, this is one just, I thought up this afternoon is like, is there any question that you haven't been asked about that week? Cause I mean, you've done so many interviews about it. I know over the years, anything that nobody knows that you would want to share. <laughs> <laughs> uh, let's see that nobody knows. Uh, yeah, it's hard to say a lot. A lot of people have asked me, you know, what I had this, this hat and it was the surf company. Uh, it was called the surf company it was called Pernici. It was a, I got kind of a small dome. And so it, it was a really low, low fitting hat. It was, it was perfect. It's perfect for me. It fit perfect. And and I just, I wore it. It was kind of my good luck charm, you know, after that 66 in the second day of stroke play. And, and I just, I did that, um, you know, so a lot of people ask me what my hat said. And, and then the other question I've always been asked was, did you marry the girl? And, and the she answer did. is yes, I'm, <laughs> I'm 100% happily married. I've got, we've got two wonderful kids. My son is 12. And my daughter's nine, and um, you know we're they're, we're all in golf, and we you know it's just uh, it's 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 been a it's been a fun run, and there's a lot there's a lot more to a lot more to go, and I still still love competing. Absolutely, you're still you're still a great player. Thanks. And now you've got a really good coach. <laughs> <laughs> so, so what what uh, so tell us you're in the Masters. Everybody wants to know about the Masters, right? That's uh, something that you can't. A lot of people can't say they've done. So give us a few little tidbits or stories about your experience. I, I had a hard time finding what you shot. What I shot a million that year. So I shot, <laughs> so the cut, the cut is usually about one over par, maybe one, two over par yeah. at the most. And that year, the, the golf course, and this was before the tiger proofing, before any rough or anything. And it was, it was an extremely uh, cold and dry winter. And the golf course played, I mean, it plays fast, but it played really fast. Mm -hmm. And uh, the cut that year was six over par. I don't know if the cut's ever been higher, really. Um, it was six over that year. And I shot, I shot six over the first day and I shot seven over the, so I shot 78, 79. Oh, you, you broke, you broke par. You broke yeah. 80. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. It played, it yeah, played. Par. <laughs> it played so difficult. It was unbelievable. My swing was not, I wasn't quite on with some things and the greens were, were faster than I'd ever experienced in my life. You have no frame of reference at the mat. At, you know, you, you have, a, you look at a 50 footer or a 60 footer or whatever, and you, and you know, you have a frame of reference maybe from another hole that you've played or a green that you, and you have no frame of reference when you play at Augusta because you have to hit a 50 or 60 footer so softly. And like gravity just takes over and it just like the ball doesn't stop. And uh, I had amazing, amazing time there though. I, I remember I stayed in the crow's nest a few nights. That's sweet. That was unbelievable. I drove in from a, a collegiate event, my beat up Honda civic and I uh, get to the gate Sunday night before the week of the event. And I pull in, it's like nine o'clock at night. It's dark. And, and I, you know, I tell the guard, Hey, I'm, I'm Steve Scott. I'm here. I'm staying in the crow's nest. I'm playing the masters. And he, you know, he kind of looks at me a little funny and, you know, okay, whatever. I showed him my ID and he lets me through the gate. And I go up there, one of the assistant professionals, a guy named Doug Motch, gave me a gave me a, a look around and showed me up to the crow's nest. And, you know, the stairs up to the crow's nest are almost, they're so steep. It's almost like a ladder. It's so, I mean, you, if, you, if you're going, you could eat it so easily going down. It's not even funny. <laughs> but, but right down at the bottom of the stairs, it's, that's on the third level of the clubhouse. The second level uh, houses a lot of things, including the champion's locker room and the champion's locker room. I mean, you walk down the crow's nest from the crow's nest and you make a, you make a left and the champion's locker room is right there. 
Mm-hmm. And so I snuck in there at 11 o'clock at night when I got there and I realized Nicholas only had one green jacket and, and, uh, you know, just, you just look around and man, like think about the people who've walked through that locker room. And it's just like, and I'm saying to myself, I'm going to be playing the masters this week. Like so maybe cool. I could be in this lock, this champions locker room at some point. And, uh, it didn't turn out to be, but, uh, uh, it's just an unbelievable week. I got to play with Justin Leonard in a practice round on Monday. I played with Jack Nicholas on Tuesday and I played with uh, Steve Elkington and Greg Norman on Wednesday. Oh my gosh! How so good is that? it was, you know, it was it was the greatest time ever. And your uh, girlfriend, wife, was caddying that week as well. On the bag, she had the white the white jumpsuit. Yeah, and uh, yeah, yeah, it was it was just a tremendous time. We we got a lot of great pictures from it and playing the par three uh, played, contest as played well. Played the par three contest. I remember hitting it like a foot on the third hole and I'm thinking, Hey, I might, I might win something. And you know, somebody made a hole in one before I'm like, okay, great. So, but, uh, (laughs) but yeah, like that's the, I mean, that's the coolest thing. It just goes by too quickly. (laughs) It just goes by too quickly. You're having so much fun and you're looking around and it's, it's the, the masters is such a, it's such a cool event. And I, I can't wait to, I can't wait to see a fall masters this year. God willing, we can get, we can, we can see that and they'll be able to host it in November. I, I can't wait to see that. Yeah. So you, you turn pro cause you're, you're number one in the world. Thanks to Tiger, Tiger Woods turning pro, right? Open the door for you there and you're obviously playing well. Um, when did you turn pro and like take us through that stint of your career and then how you decided to now be one of us, <laughs> a PGA, yeah, PGA yeah. member slash club pro slash teaching pro. Yeah. <laughs> you know, I, I had, I had some putting issues during college. My putting got really hot and cold. And after that tiger match, I probably put a little too much pressure on myself. And, you know, I didn't, I didn't, I just didn't, uh, I, I made a couple of dumb decisions looking back on some things and my putting, I, 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 I basically got the yips in college. I mean, I, yeah. I had, I, I, I use a, a really funky putting grip now that really yeah. works and has overcome the yips. I'd be happy to, <laughs> yeah, I call it the gator clamp. I kind of yeah. run this up the forearm of my left arm and I clamp it in in a pronated position with my right hand. And, uh, but it, it's a, uh, my putting kind of, it, it came and went and, and when it was good, it was good. When it wasn't, it wasn't. And so I had, you know, I was hot and cold during college, but I finished in, in 1999, well, 97, I made the Walker cup team, which was fantastic. Yeah. Kind of carried over from that, that 96 AM. And, uh, I guess I'd won the dogwood invitational that summer as well in 97. So, but that was like the first time I started feeling yippy with my putting. I'm like, Oh man, this, wow. is, this is not good. And, you know, kind of squeaking a few three footers in at the dog, but I'm like, what is going on? Like, it's like yeah. an electric, I, I don't wish it on anybody. Um, I've it. Luckily, I've never had it. <laughs> it's, 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 it's literally awful. And that really, really curtailed my, my eventual professional career overall. But um, 1999, I, I learned to kind of, I putted with the Bernhard Langer putting style, very similar to what I do now, mm-hmm. but just more of a conventional right hand clamping against the arm with the shaft. I learned that from the Dave Pell school and, and I won, I hadn't won a college event until the spring of my senior year. And mm-hmm. with all of that great play, I hadn't won a college event. And with this new putting grip, I win three out of four in the spring of my senior year. Wow. I just I got on a tear and and got second team All American, was SEC Player of the Year, and it was it was a great I mean it was a great year. And I make the Walker Cup team uh, after winning the the Western Amateur that summer. And you know I finished my college career. My last event was the Walker Cup in, at in Scotland at Nairn, and so to be a two time Walker Cupper was is something I'll always be proud of. And, um, you know, it was just, I, I, I had, I had a great run and turn, then I turned pro and yeah, I, I did okay. I, I didn't, I didn't make my tour card right away, which, uh, you know, I, I, and, and the yips kind of showed themselves in the second round of my, uh, PJ tour qualifying school. I was, I was in second place after two rounds and I shoot 75, 77 to miss by two shots. Wow, and I've got really, I just got yippy with it. I mean, I literally, I couldn't make a five footer, and and I, I missed going to the finals by two shots, and having any 
any status at all. And that like, that was, that was probably the biggest crushing blow I've ever had in my life. That was, I, that was really, that was tough. I, I didn't, you know, from there, you don't really know what to do. You don't really have a place to play. Uh, I was fortunate enough to get a few sponsor exemptions and some tour events mm-hmm. the year of 2000. And, but, uh, you know, I played the mini tours largely. I, I caddied at Seminole golf club down in, in, uh, in South Florida, the famed Seminole down there, the Donald Ross masterpiece. Uh, I caddied down there for a couple winters to make a few bucks. And, um, yeah, it was just, uh, I kind of went from the top of the world to the absolute bottom. And it was, you know, you, 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 you learn a lot and you try to dig yourself out of those holes and that those, those, those moments, they're not, they're not great. <laughs> yeah. So what was the, the final, I guess, straw that broke the camel's back or you decided I got to go to work? Yeah. You know, I just, I wasn't having fun with it. I, 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 I had a a couple good years. I played in the Canadian tour for three years. I had a couple of victories. That's right. Yeah. I had two victories out there and um, I, I played okay. The golf courses kind of suited me. They weren't too long mm-hmm. uh, because, you know, remember the, the golf ball. So, so the golf ball changes to a solid core golf ball in the year 2000. So golf, golf changed mm-hmm. uh, essentially the, the whole, I built my game on a spinny golf ball the, you know, hitting a, a sweeping draw that really, you know, and I didn't realize that how much spin it was knocking off at the time. I just knew that it was going farther and it was working right. for me. And, and you, you, you try to hit that, go- that same kind of trap draw spinny with a sp- or shot with a spinny ball or with a non spinny ball, it doesn't stay in the air. So, so unbeknownst to me, I'm kind of, you know, the, the, the tour events I played, the greens are firm. And so you got to launch it really high and, like you don't you know there's not track man or there's really no launch monitors in 2000 or 2001 to really to really know exactly really I wasn't involved with them and I really really don't don't have the same information that you do today and mm-hmm. so you know my swing I had to kind of change my swing I kind of had to hang back a little to launch the ball a little higher cuz these low scud missiles weren't stopping and <laughs> you know and, and you hit these back in the stands, five irons, they're not stopping. I mean, they're not, they're, they're just not. And so, um, uh, it, so, so technology didn't probably wasn't in my favor, uh, also. And, you know, things just kind of started to change. And I, I, I had a crummy year in 2003. I had my, my conditional status on what's now the corn Ferry tour. I played in 10 events out there. I missed all the cuts. I played awful. I had the worst attitude because I wasn't, in a comfortable state of mind to play met with Bob Toskey later that year, the great, the hall of fame teacher. And, and I spent six months with Toskey. I mean, watching him give lessons, taking lessons, which really kind of, it started my, like I I started getting all this knowledge that I really never had. And Mm -hmm. Toskey never charged me for a lesson either. uh, Like my first teacher. And because I, again, I didn't have all this money to, to blow on lessons. And so so Toski never charged for a lesson. I spent hundreds of hours with with Bob, and they were looking back. They were the they were the greatest time I ever had. What uh, an education! He would, you know, we we would go out to we would go out to lunch. He would he would have a bowl of chicken soup and a Heineken, and we'd go back and do some more work. And it was just it was the great it was the greatest time ever. And and I got this enthusiasm that he passed on to me from teaching. And, and it's, I started helping a couple people that I knew just kind of with a couple things and, and I started having fun with it, you know, but at the same time I went back on the Canadian tour in 2004 and uh, I played pretty well. I think I was fifth on the money list or something, had a pretty nice year and almost won an event. I lost in a playoff and, and you, you know, and then I didn't make it in Q school again. And I, I kind of started losing the fun of it and the fun just kind of, it evaporated for me, honestly. And it became too much like a job. A job. It became right. a job. And 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 I just I wasn't I didn't have the success in the first five years that I thought I would. And and you know, I wasn't making through Q school, which is everything. And so and I didn't I didn't really want to be that guy who you know, I kind of had some foresight. I mean, I was twenty six or seven at the time and still lots of years ahead of me, but I, I guess I didn't want to be the 35 year old still trying to make a cut on, on a mini tour event. I just, I didn't want to, I didn't want to be that guy. So, so I, I, and I was married, I got married right out of college. So 
I've been married for a few years since 1999. And, you know, we wanted to start a family at some point. And, you know, like you need you need a steady stream of income to do that. And so, uh, you know, I just I decided, hey, you know, I really enjoy teaching. Let's let's go get a job at the you know, I, I uh, my last mini tour event ever. It was it was it was perfect. My last mini tour event ever was at uh, PGA National, the champion course. And, and I missed the cut. And I walked right over to the Golf Digest school that was r- right there at PGA National and knocked on the door and asked for a job. And that was that was literally it that day. I mean, I was no joke. I was fed up. <laughs> Did they give you a job? I got a, I, I started teaching there and I taught nice. there for a couple of winters and and that was great. I learned a lot. And and then I started working in the summer up in the northeast and got a head pro job. My first head pro job pretty quickly in 2009 and in New Jersey. And then three years later, I moved to the Mets section in New York, which is a great playing section. And is that uh, the Paramount, 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 Paramount Club? Country Club. Yeah. And yeah. yeah, I just, you know, I just love, I just, I, I, I love teaching and I love playing. I love those two aspects. And the Mets section really was, was all about playing and teaching. And so yeah, I, 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 I really, I really enjoyed it up there. And, and my game kind of went in the tank a little bit uh, early on, but I, 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 I got things together and uh, and straightened it out and simplified my game a little bit. Yeah, you've done you've done quite well, and, that, and it's still a way to play in PGA yeah. championships, right? Mm-hmm. And CPT, you know, CPCs and all that. So you're still fear, you know, having the fire of that competitive uh, environment. Yeah, pro- from a different standpoint, yeah. they're still great, great players. Probably the greatest thing I I mean now being in the Carolina section. Uh, there are three PGA tour events we can qualify for in the Carolinas, the RBC yeah. heritage, which yep. I, which I end up qualifying for in 2018. And last year I was, well, in 2018, I ended up being the player of the year in the section and the section champ. So I got to play in both the Wells Fargo at Quail Hollow and the Wyndham championship at Sedgefield. So I have mean, played in three PGA tour events and, you know, be, to be able to kind of go back in that arena again and, and to do that, and I mean, I don't have the distance that I need by any means, but but man, it's 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 really fun to get out there and and you know and see Rory McIlroy in the on the range or watch these guys and kind of you know be able to say, hey, I I went toe to toe with them when I was when forty two, forty three, and and hopefully I qualify for the PGA Championship this year. I'm in the National Club Pro uh, in uh, next month in uh, in at Barton Creek in July, so. You know, cross yeah. my fingers. Hopefully, I, I I still love competing. It's in my blood. It always will be. That's awesome. So, talk about your job now. It's a kind of a unique situation that you're in, um, with your with your job, and then also, I want to get into your commentation and your your new career as a uh, analyst. Yeah. So, I think that that's pretty interesting as well. Yeah, we, I've I've got I've got one of the greatest PGA professional jobs out there. I'm the head professional for the Outpost Club, which is a national golfing society. It's been in existence over 10 years, and we have over 800 members that live domestically and some live internationally. And we set up, we we connect with some of the greatest architecturally significant clubs anywhere in the world. And we set up a, a lot of events for our members at these clubs, and we have a, a concierge service as well. And, and, but, uh, you know, really, we we set up events at places like East Lake or Old Town or Oakmont or Sand Valley or Pebble Beach or I mean, you know, the great private and the great resorts and I mean St Andrews and uh, Terra Edie in New Zealand and I mean, you name it. We pretty much go anywhere you'd want to go. We set up an event for our members, and so the Outpost Club has been tremendous and. So I travel a lot and I help run events for the Outpost Club. And we've also created, which is a little bit more my baby, we've created the Silver Club Golfing Society, which is a competitive offshoot of the Outpost Club. Uh, we set up events at great places just like the Outpost Club. Uh, we had events last year at Quaker Ridge, Inverness Club, Pasa Tiempo. This year we'll be going to Prairie Dunes, Trinity Forest. I mean, all places that really... Yeah, you know, nice. pique your interest on the the golfing architecture radar, and and so, but the the difference between the Silver Club and the Outpost Club is that Silver Club is 
is more competitive. We have players that are plus handicaps all the way up to 9.9 index. So anybody who's a single digit to a plus uh, can be involved with our Silver Club Golfing Society. And you can just check us out on the web, silverclubgs.com and learn some stuff. And and the Outpost Club's been great too. And we just, you know, we're all under the same umbrella. And, you know, essentially we, all of our members, they really appreciate the game very much. And they appreciate being able to play all these wonderful places that I mentioned. And, and, and they're always happy to be there. I mean, they're always, it's, it's not a, a typical, um, you know, I was a head pro for nine years at a couple of different clubs. And there's, there's a lot of things that, uh, <laughs> that you have to worry about as a head pro at a club, like the cart fleet or your, you know, your professional staff and how those, they change and evolve. And, you know, really we have a few pre-GA professionals with our crew and we have three founders and we have a few people that travel uh, with our events to help run them. And, and that's, uh, you know, it's just the office changes kind of all the time. Uh, and it's, it's a lot of fun for me to, to go and see all these great places around the country too. Yeah, it's got to be such a cool job. I would love to travel that much. I, hopefully my job will take me to some of those places to coach and teach and play. They will. So I'm, they definitely, will. I'm definitely jealous for, for that. So so talk a little bit about uh, your your commentator role. And you've done some, some work for Fox and then now you say like for PGA Tour. And that's sort of basically why we met, right? So I really appreciate the fact that you're trying to do your homework as far as getting accurate teaching information that you're going to share on the air, which is one of my pet peeves as we've talked about of some of the the commentators out there that are kind of spewing some, some, some information that could not, could not be more uh, wrong for, for golfers. So talk a little bit about that. And then, and then uh, you know, how you're, how you're doing your research and what you've learned. Yeah, I, I really enjoy the broadcasting side of it. It's, it, it really is. Uh, it's exciting to be able. I mean, if I can't, if I'm not out there playing the event, I mean, being able to call the event and being able to call shots for the greatest players in the world is is very special. And it's 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 a rush. I mean, let's face it. I, I've been. I had my first my first uh, tryout with Fox back in 2016 at the U.S. Girls Junior Amateur that was at Ridgewood Country Club. It was up in New Jersey, not too far away from where I was a head pro at. And and they they liked what I did, and they, they kept calling me back. And so I work uh, – Fox only does about eight events on a normal year. This year there's four events uh, that they'll do, uh, uh, the two Opens and the two Amateurs. But they, they, do, they do eight events for the USGA on a normal year. And, and I do – I fit in for about three of them every year. Uh, so I've done, I was an on-course commentator for, I mean, I followed Freddie couples around during the senior open. I followed, uh, we do featured groups and, and whatnot. I followed, uh, you know, Lexi Thompson and, you know, in the women's open, we followed, uh, um, I mean, for the U S open, we followed, I mean, you name it, tiger to DJ to Jordan. To, I mean, we're, I mean, to be able to call shots for, for these guys. It's just like, it's, it's one of the coolest things ever. And, and, and yeah. you know, furthermore, I mean, to, to, and, and, you know, I, I've, I've kind of worked my way through, I, I became last year, I got in a little bit more in the analyst role inside the booth and I've, I worked the, uh, well, 2018, I guess I worked the, uh, no, it was 2019. Sorry. It was the, I worked the PGA championship for Turner sports mm-hmm. and PGA.com and, and we had a we had an amazing serendipity actually the uh quick story on this the the week before the PGA this is a Beth Page when Brooks Kepka won there was uh Ian Baker Finch's a mother-in-law passed away or something and so he couldn't make the telecast so so that sent off like a chain reaction through through everything and and everybody kind of had to fill in other spots and so i get a call monday night of of PGA championship week. I'm not on the telecast. I get a call Monday night. We need you at Beth page tomorrow morning. I'm like, Oh my gosh, I can't pack, my, pack my bags fast enough. Oh, and by the way, <laughs> and by the way, your, your group that you're going to cover on Monday, on Thursday morning. And there's going to be, there was no TV, no live broadcast coverage until one o'clock that afternoon. But the featured group that we covered was none other than tiger. That was his first event back after winning the masters. Brooks Kepka, who went out and shot 63 that day, and Francesco Molinari. 
And yeah, I remember you, that. Can, yeah. you can look at that on YouTube and whatever. And, and I look back and I was working with Brian Katrick. I was the analyst and the, and it was, man, I mean, it was, it was unbelievable. And that, that kind of helped open a, you know, because that, that one round got some, got some eyeballs from some people. I kind of opened up a door with PGA tour live because of that. And, um, it's opened up a few other doors as well, but you know, sometimes, you know, sometimes you, you gotta be a little fortunate and be in the right place at the right time and then try to do a great job and, and be prepared. Yeah. And, you know, certainly the reason why, why I, you know, I ran into you and wanted to speak with you and I've, I've done this with a few other, I, I a few other professionals as well, but you're, you know, to, to, I, I like the way you presented your information. And so, you know, to get, you know, when I was doing this work at, at Pebble Beach, like I mentioned earlier, uh, we did, I was the swing instructor working on uh, yeah. PGA Tour Live segment. Uh, well, really all four days at Pebble Beach and we we're covering the 16th hole and we, every player that would go through, we, you know, I'd, I would, we, we would show on direct TV or something and I'd, you know, I'd be drawing lines and doing things like you would in a lesson. And, but uh, you know, to, to, to be able to analyze all these guys' swings and show some comparisons between a guy like, let's say, Jimmy Walker, who's very upright and, you know, maybe a little bit more hand rotation and hits a draw versus the flat rotational move, body rotational move of a Dustin Johnson or a, or a uh, Matt Kuchar, for example. You know, it, mm-hmm. it was, it's pretty cool to kind of show the, the dichotomy of, of, of different styles that, that work pretty well. I, and I come to, I come to really think that the, the flatter the golf swing is, those guys seem to be better ball strikers overall. Like that, that'd be my, that'd be my overall take on it. Maybe it's a little generalization, but, yeah. um, you know, Harold Irwin or Colin Montgomery might, uh, <laughs> might uh, have beef with that, but. Yeah, yeah, but but no, I I think really Brand, Brando may not agree with that. May not agree with that, but, <laughs> but I think which is okay. But, but you look at the better <laughs> ball strikers and 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 they they seem to have, you know, they're they're more let's say forty. I don't know. I guess they're they're they seem to be just more neutral with their uh, as as opposed to upright. You know, neutral to flat as opposed to upright. That's kind of that's my yeah. philosophy at least. My take on on watching all these guys. It was cool. I mean, I was checking you out. Uh, you told me what you were on direct TV and it was cool to hear you say a few of the things and draw a couple of the lines that we had discussed yep. uh, in our lesson and our little time together. So it was, pr- it was pretty neat to have some somewhat of an influence on what you were sharing, which I thought was great. I mean, I think it, we need more of that in the game. Like I said, I think you've got a future if you continue to just, you know, keep getting better and keep keep getting the the good information because then you don't get ripped <laughs> by coaches like me. Uh, yeah, you certainly want to <laughs> give know, he, accurate. He, he, got a, he got ahead of it, you know, when he hit it to the right or something stupid like that. Yeah, you like, realize that, yeah, they, they <laughs> missed the ball right, not just because, you know, the club face not, might not have been open. They might have been just a complete mishit. It might have been way on yeah. the toe. Or it was actually fun to, in that Pebble Beach Pro-Am, to, they, we analyzed some amateur swings as well. And those right. were actually like a, lot, saw some bad a lot more fun. Amateur I mean, you watch, the, you watch that club face twist all over the place because they hit it so far off center sometimes. And, uh, yeah. But, yeah, it's, 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 it's a lot of fun. The teaching is a passion of mine. In my current role, I don't do it quite as much as, uh, as, as I used to, for sure, being at a particular club and, you know, camping out on the range per se, like you do. But I, I, I mean, to be able to, to analyze golf swings of the greatest players in the world, like, I mean, it, it, it kind of doesn't get really better than that. <laughs> sure. Awesome, man. That's really cool. All right. You ready for a few quick hitters before we wrap? All right. So when you feel overwhelmed or unfocused, like well, I would say when you're stressed out, what do you do? What are some of your tactics or your go-tos? Stressed out, like, like, uh, in in, just a, in any, a tournament round or just a no no just in life or yeah, well yeah we can talk about that too but just in in life in general you know you have a maybe you're having a bad day or a bad stretch like you I mean do you meditate do you I mean what what are your go tos to sort of say like, I I need to get recentered Honestly, pump, pumping some iron really really gets the gets the frustration out for sure it it, it it's a good it's a good mental release and obviously physical release and. Um, you know, doing that and having a, having a, some sort of a routine as far as that goes. And, you know, I'm a good, I work out well, you know, if, if I don't work out before 10 o'clock, I, I don't work out. Like I have to, sure. I have to work out in the morning. And 
So, you know, that's, that's, that really helps me a lot. Um, I, I wouldn't say I necessarily meditate or anything, but I just, I, I just, uh, I think, I think getting some really good physical activity, um, is a good, uh, I, 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 when I play golf, I, I walk pretty much every time. And so that's a, it's, it's just a good stress reliever to be out there in nature. Unfortunately, we're able as golfers, we're able to socially distance and play this game still right now. So it's good. Mm-hmm. So what's an unusual habit or an absurd thing that you love? Unusual. Maybe something, something that nobody's, nobody's, uh, nobody knows. I like, I like not even your wife. cutting my own yard and, and maintaining my yard. I, my goal is to make it look like Augusta national, but I, I, okay. I, uh, I, I, I failed in that because I, I over fertilized a few spots and I totally burned out a few spots in my yard. So I'm, uh, uh, we've got to get some sod work done. <laughs> you're, you're, you're fired as a greenskeeper. Then. Yeah, but I, I, I enjoy, I enjoy rehabbing it and, uh, and making it look really good, overseeding it in the winter and, and, uh, you know, making a nice tight line on the, on the edging and stuff. That's, that's, that, that's a, it's peaceful for me. What skills or projects that did you get done over quarantine that you were, could share anything. Yeah. Did you learn anything new? I know I had a, I have a, a long list of stuff that I kind of did because I finally had time to do it. I learned that I really don't like painting, uh, like a painting a wall <laughs> or a room. My wife and I, we tackled our, our bathroom, which has about three or four windows and lots of trims and all the, and it took a space that probably should have taken a couple of days. We spent, we spread it out over a week and it was, you know, I, I, it, it looks really good, but man, I, I, I don't want to ever paint again. I really don't. I hear you. So if you could get a message to the world and put it on a gigantic billboard, what would your message say and why? Hmm. That's a, that's a, that's a great question. I think, uh, I think it really, it has to, I, I would just go back to, you know, a lot of the, I don't know, I, I guess probably the sportsmanship and the integrity of golf and, and how you should, I think the sportsmanship and integrity of golf and how you, you should live your life in that realm. And, 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 you know, with a, with a sense of morality, really. Um, I mean, I guess that that's probably what I would wish on everybody. And, and, you know, unfortunately in, in this world, there's a lot of falsehoods that are told and, and, um, you know, people's people, uh, it's, it's anyway, I, I guess I, you, you have to live your life in a way that, that you can go to sleep at night and have a very clear conscience. I think that that's, I think that's very important. I think that that's, uh, Absolutely. I think that's extremely important. Yeah. Are there any books that are books that you'd recommend that have had an influence on your, your life or your career that are books that you've gifted to friends that you would mention? Ah, you know, I'm, I'm not, I can't call myself an avid reader by any means. I was going to say, we didn't really talk about it. I was just a shot in the dark, but yeah, I, I, it's okay if you but don't. I, you know, if I do read a book, it's probably about golf or the history. Uh, mm-hmm. You know, there, there's a great book. There's a, there's a man who was the first Caucasian caddy at Augusta national. His name is Trip Bowden. And he wrote a book called Freddie and me. And I would highly recommend it. To it. It's been out for a, it's been out for several years now, I think, and he's written a few other books. Uh, but he lives in Augusta, Georgia now. He grew up there, and basically the story goes that he he became as a as a young as a young boy he became very good friends with a man named Freddie Bennett, who was the mm-hmm. caddy master for forty years at Augusta National, and it, because because Tripp's father was Freddie's doctor. And Freddie would come over to the house and, and, and anyway, th- this, this book has a lot of really good lessons in it, but, um, you know, long story short, Trip ended up being the first Caucasian white caddy at Augusta national in amongst of, of all the African-American caddies. And, and, um, it, it's, it's a really, it's a really cool story of friendship. And so I, I would highly recommend, I would highly recommend that book by Trip. I like it. Thank you. Any, any, uh, topics or questions that I haven't asked you that you'd like to share? 
or anything you want to ask me hmm. before we close? Uh, that's a you've given us a okay. you've given us a lot. Okay, uh, well, I really I, appreciate. I, it. No, I will ask. Great. I will ask you what. Yeah. What sort okay. of you you obviously have a tremendous amount of golf swing knowledge. You 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 study it. You teach it. You instruct people all the time. You said you're out there for nine hours today teaching. Uh, and, and, you know, a lot of hours per week, what, what sort of things are, are we going to see in the pipeline maybe in, or, or is there a, a new instruction thing that, that you're picking up on from somebody that you, you feel like it's a very good thing or that, or, or is there, or, or maybe what else do you have to learn or maybe you don't know what you have to learn because you haven't learned it, but, but what, yeah. what sort of things out there do you know, might you feel like you still need to fill in in your teaching repertoire? That's a, that's a great question. I think, you know, I'm always looking for like the new technology. Um, but a lot of guys out there, friends of mine, coaches are sharing more and more information. And I think that is one of the positives that's come out of this quarantine is guys are going online doing doing programs, whether it's Scott Calx, you know, it's Phil Kenyon, they're putting together these programs that you can go and, you know, learn virtually, right? Because if we can't visit them right now, then they're doing that. So it's, it's just, I don't know, man, I'm just, I'm always trying to just keep my ears open, listening to, to, to really smart people that are way better than me and just trying to, trying to get better. I mean, I think the as far as technology goes, I'm always trying to learn more about putting because that's one of my passions. Mm-hmm. Um, but I think the in the future, you know, things like putt view and things like Capto are becoming a little bit more portable to where you can carry them with you on the course. I mean, I think the next realm, and I know Trackman's trying to do a better job with our putting thing, but the next realm is to develop training aids and technology that you can actually test players in the real world right when they're actually playing yeah, yeah as opposed to standing in my building hitting shots yeah. right as we know that's that's it, it's valuable but it's not exactly yeah that simulated yeah. as a, as a golf as a golf round or you know under pressure that type of thing so i think that's what's coming uh, i think virtual reality is probably a few years away as well cool. but yeah it's just i don't know man it's it's i'm always just trying to like pick everybody's brain that I think I can learn from and, and then obviously share it with other people like yourself and for young coaches. For me, that's, that's the reason I do this podcast is to really pass on the knowledge that I've acquired over the years and leave, uh, leave this teaching game and in, in golf in, in better hands than when I found it. Cool. Well, uh, yeah, I can't, can't wait to see what's next out there and, and keep, keep learning. From yeah. It. Absolutely. So, I mean, I, I really appreciate your time and getting to know you better. And I feel like we're going to spend a lot more time together in the future. You definitely got to come back to Carmel and, uh, or I want to come visit you, um, for sure, but let everybody know like how they can get a hold of you. I mean, on social platforms, if email, whatever you want to give out, yeah. um, it's up yeah. to you, but I always yeah. like to get that opportunity. Yeah, for sure. For sure. I'm on Instagram and Twitter at S Scott PGA and, I'm somewhere on Facebook too, but I don't think that matters as much. Uh, yeah. yeah, that's yeah. I, I, Instagram and Instagram and Twitter are the, they're, they're the main ones. And uh, yeah, just, I love throwing out, you know, if, if, if I'm watching a, a golf tournament or if, if something that I see really jumps to mind, I'll, I'll capture it on video and I'll post on my Instagram and with a, you know, kind of a, a lesson for the day. I remember watching Tiger at the Zozo championship that he won uh, back in October, I guess it was, or something. Mm-hmm. And his his routine was so good. It was so good. He from the point where he stood behind the ball to when he actually made impact was like ten seconds or something. And there was so much flow and athleticism. I I capture that and put that on Instagram. And you know, I just I I like to pick up on those things that that the best players in the world do because I think that they're so. They're so important for people, not even not just people who who want to play competitively or whatever, but who want to get out there and and just you know play better golf, you know, as a ten handicap or twenty. It doesn't matter. Like there's these little things That's that right. these pros do that anybody can do. So uh, I I, I yeah. love picking up those things. 
That's great, man. Well, I appreciate your time and I appreciate you sharing your stories and, and your knowledge and continued success, my man. You're going to, you're going to be amazing on TV and then continue to do great things in the game. That's great, Jason. Thank you. Thanks so much for having me on. Absolutely. What's up, everybody? Guru back here again with a couple of things before you jump off. First, a big thank you to Steve for coming on the show and sharing his story and his insights about golf and life. Uh, make sure you give him a follow uh, on the gram and Twitter at SScottPGA and give him a social wave and say thank you. Uh, thank you again to our sponsors, EnviedHemp.com and Swing You. Make sure you use the promo code GURU20 for a 20% discount for life when you order your CBD products through EnviedHemp.com. Also, make sure you go to the App Store and download the Golf Guru app. Uh, and you can also follow me and reach me on Twitter or Instagram at Golf Guru TV. Also, check out my website coming very soon. Just updating it at GolfGuruTV.net. Uh, where you can find videos, articles, and more information on my teaching and coaching. And also make sure you leave your email so you can sign up for my newsletter coming very soon. Uh, if you have a question or a comment, you can email the show at golfgurushow at gmail.com or hit me up on the DM. Music is by Kevin McLeod and Zach Mullet. And leave me an iTunes review. That would be great. Leave me a five-star rating. That would be even better. So as I leave you with the infamous Jim Rohn quote, study, practice, teach, and then pass it on. Thank you so much for listening. I'll talk to you next time.